good morning today i will begin my discussion with uh, the particular text to this uh, 12th night by william shakespeare and uh, at the very onset we have to discuss on the basic patterns of uh, the basic features of shakespearean comedy or that is considered today as a romantic comedy fundamentally whenever we know something about comedy the first thing that comes to our mind that what are the basic differences between comedy and tragedy in general and uh, what are the chief ingredients of shakespearean comedy that you can trace in uh, 12th night as you like it or maybe the other plays that are renowned for examples of shakespearean romantic comedy uh, as we know that uh, romantic comedy was developed um, I'm reading from M. H. Abrams, as it has been pointed out, that in the most common literary application, a comedy is a fictional work in which the materials are selected and managed primarily in order to interest and amuse us. It is the fundamental thing that you know that it is considered as the the chief ingredient of a comedy is considered to be uh, laughter because it it comes to amuse us. The characters and their discomfitures engage our pleasurable attention rather than our profound concern that means it is the the pleasurable thing that is generally being considered as a part of comedies in general we are made to feel confident that no great disaster will occur and usually the action turns out happily for the chief characters the term comedy is customarily applied only to plays for the stage or to motion pictures it should be noted however that the comic form as just defined also occurs in prose fiction and narrative poetry etc so fundamentally we can find that whenever we are dealing with a comedy or rather the the particular genre comedy then we have to uh, keep it in mind that comedy is a part of a drama you know in aristotelian formation of poetry we have already discussed while dealing with tragedy that the dramatic poetry can be divided into as aristotle opined into two uh, sections the first is called the tragic dramatic poetry that is known today as tragedy and the second one is the comic dramatic poetry that is known today as comedy fundamentally we know that uh, there are uh, various kinds of patterns of comedy as we know there is old comedy there is new comedy okay there is comedy of humors comedy of manners and also another thing that is called the romantic comedy M. H. Abrams points out that romantic comedy was developed by Elizabethan dramatists on the model of contemporary prose romances, such as Thomas Lodge's *Rosalind*, the source of Shakespeare's *As You Like It*, as we know, because the name *Rosalind* is uh, in *As You Like It* the the heroine. The name of the heroine is Rosalind. Such comedy represents what happens to be present there. There is a love affair that involves a beautiful and engaging heroine, sometimes disguised as a man, etc. The course of this love doesn't run smooth, yet overcomes all difficulties to end in a happy union. Okay, many of the boy meets girl plots of later writers are instances of romantic comedy, as are many motion pictures, etc. North of Fry. points out that some of the shakespearean romantic comedies manifest a movement from the normal world of conflict and trouble into the green world the forest of arden in as you like it or maybe the the fairy haunted wood of a midsummer night's dream okay so fundamentally whenever we will deal with the shakespearean comedy uh, uh, at the foremost we have to think that shakespearean comedies are generally considered as a romantic comedy okay so it is it is not so that the term romantic is not only applied to shakespearean comedy rather it can be considered to be shakespearean romantic tragedies also you see that macbeth hamlet othello king lear these are the four plays that are also considered as romantic tragedies so the question is what do we mean by romantic comedy okay if you break the term romantic you will find that the term is coming from romaunt okay and it has its direct association with the term romance and generally whenever we think of the term romance there is something imaginary there is something imaginary that is working within the structuration or within the formation of these kinds of plays uh so far as shakespearean comedies are concerned the first thing that comes to our mind 
let us deal with the features of Shakespearean comedy, or let us deal with the features of romantic comedies in general. So uh, the first thing that we find in, in Shakespearean comedy, uh, first and foremost, we, we find that the theme of love is of more importance, you see. The theme of love, you see. It is called in Shakespearean romantic comedies, Shakespearean romantic plays, we find that uh, it is the uh, love at first sight kind of thing. Uh, let us take some examples from Shakespearean romantic plays. For example, say, whenever we think of, uh, maybe say, as you like it, we know that uh, this a, a romantic affair is going on between, in as you like it, you can find there is a romantic love affair is going on between uh, uh, Rosaline and Orlando. And you will find that there is a love at first sight case. Not only this, as our main concern here is uh, Twelfth Night. So fundamentally, we will find that in Twelfth Night, the love at first sight is always being in work. Say, for example, in Twelfth Night, we will find that uh, there are uh, a set of characters. There is Duke Orsino, number one. Okay, there is, uh, you know, a love triangle is being constructed so, so far as the plot construction of the play is concerned. You will find that there are the characters like Duke Orsino, number one, number two, there is Olivia, and number three, there is a character whose name is Viola. Okay, and Viola, as we find that in, in Twelfth Night, Viola is disguising as uh, Cesario. Hmm? So, Fundamentally, whenever you will uh, you will find in this particular play that uh, at the very beginning, at the very opening scene of, of Twelfth Night, uh, Duke Orsino is declaring, okay, in front of Kiryu and others, uh, the, the courtiers who were present along with him, he's declaring that he had fallen in love with Lady Olivia at the first sight. Similar is in the case of Olivia. When Olivia looks for the first time, he looks Cesario, she falls suddenly in love with Cesario. Though it is, you know, Cesario is actually the disguised role that is being played by Viola. Similar is in the case of Viola. You will find that Viola falls in love with Duke Orsino uh, by looking at the for the first time. Okay? So love at first sight, or these kinds of, uh, say, patterns of love is altogether present in Shakespearean plays and, and Twelfth Night is no exception. Though you will find that there are multiple kinds of intrigues, there are multiple kinds of problems that will occur in front of them and fundamentally you will find that different kinds of problems will uh, arise and at the end in most of the plays or in all plays, all comedies by William Shakespeare, you will find that in spite of different kinds of obstacles, in spite of different kinds of problems and tussles and conflicts that they will face, at the end of the play, we will find that they lived happily ever after, okay? So the fundamental focus of the patterns of love that Shakespeare is following, that Shakespeare is, uh, to some extent, he is incorporating in his plays, you will find that they are... Uh, you know, love at first sight kind of a love affair. There are multiple kinds of problems and tussles that will come in between. And at the end, we will find that they will live happily ever after. That means it ends happily. That is the fundamental thing that we find here. Another important feature that we find in Shakespearean plays, this is obviously relating to the setting of the, of the, of the plays or setting of the comedies. Fundamentally, uh, take take two or three plays or uh, romantic comedies by Shakespeare. The first one is obviously it is for it is uh, as you like it. You see, and uh, you will find that as you like it, the setting of as you like it is obviously it is. Uh, it has to be considered as uh, the forest of Arden. You know, this this Arden is is being associated with the the, the company Arden Shakespeare that is being named after uh, as you like it and the forest of Arden. So uh, what I'm trying to suggest here, the Forest of Arden is the actual setting where Rosaline and Orlando and the other characters, they had to move, okay? So Shakespeare just placed the characters from a, any particular setting to Forest of Arden. Similar is in the case of, uh, say, A Midsummer Night's Dream. And you will find that the fundamental setting, that the setting of this particular play is considered to be the wood, the wood where the fairies live. The main characters, you see, there is the, the, the two pair of lovers. 
there is Hermia, there is Helena, there is Demetrius, there is Lysander, and along with them, there are other characters who are gradually moving towards the particular wood where the fairies like Titania and Oberon lived. Another case, say for example, that is the primary concern, our, uh, our primary concern, that is Twelfth Night, you will find the setting of Twelfth Night is Illyria. Okay, and gradually if you try to identify the name Illyria, what is the significance of this name, you will find that Illyria, probably this particular name is coming from illusions, it is the land of illusions. My question is, why does Shakespeare use uh, the, the plays like Forest of Arden or maybe the Furies Wood or maybe Illyria as the setting of, of his plays or for his plays or typically the comedies you see. The fundamental reason why Shakespeare is using them, the imaginary settings you see, the Forest of Ordinary, Lydia, Fairies, Wood, just to create a kind of a make-believe world, you see. These are the places where everything can be possible. And Shakespeare is deliberately choosing them. He is just placing his characters from the typical Athenian life or maybe any particular, any particular uh, space, you see. Uh, the, the geographical locations are available. Okay, and he, they are taken from that particular place and have been placed to a, a particular setting, you see, where you cannot find any geographical location to be identified. Why? Because it is the fundamental focus of Shakespeare to create a make believe world to make his characters free from, you know, the legal customs and legal orientations that have been ascribed to any known place. So here, here everything is possible. So ultimately, you will find that in these places, you see, the imaginary places, uh, that the characters are doing and playing their roles, and you cannot just take them and uh, just carry them with the typical legal constructions of any known place. So Shakespeare is deliberately choosing that. Shakespeare is deliberately making the setting very important. Okay. Another important thing that I have traced in, in, in Shakespearean comedies these are the references to the heroines, you know. The characters like Rosaline, the characters like Viola, the characters like Olivia, the characters like Portia, you know, there is Hermia, Helena, you know, Rosalind in As You Like It, Viola and Olivia in Twelfth Night, Portia in Merchant of Venice, and Hermia and Helena, these are the characters they are taken from uh, uh, A Midsummer Night's Dream. You will find that concerning the other characters, specifically, say, for example, uh, uh, say Orlando or maybe Duke Orsino or maybe Antonio and Bassanio or maybe Demetrius and and uh, there is uh, Lysander. So ultimately if you try to compare between the qualities of these characters you will find that the heroines are more important than the heroes. Not only important regarding the construction of the plot Rather, you will find that the heroines have been placed with much more intellect, you see. They are the intelligent characters. They have more fundamental reasoning than the male characters present within this play. Take, for example, uh, uh, say, Twelfth Night. In Twelfth Night, you will find that Duke Orsino, you will find that Duke Orsino, to some extent, Duke Orsino is being treated as a character who is suffering from a kind of, you know, uh, the melancholic temperament within him, okay? Ideologically, he is very poor. Somehow, in, in front of the characters like Viola and Olivia, obviously there is a male character like Feste, the fool, but he has to be treated in a different way because he is not belonging to the upper strata of society and Shakespeare is treating Feste with a, with a different outlook, with a different mood. So fundamentally what I'm trying to suggest here that whether, whereas in case of the Shakespearean tragedies like Hamlet, Othello, King Lear and Macbeth, you will find that the male core characters are dominating or predominating because you cannot find that the, the female characters are very much important except few you see that the characters like Lady Macbeth and others. But ultimately they are blurred in, in the face of the main characters and so that that is why you will find that the names of these plays are 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 being following the character itself, right? So it is not to be considered in case of Shakespearean romantic comedies because you here you will find that the characters obviously they're important, but at the same time you will find that the names of the plays are not to be uh, associated with any particular character. Say for example, 
uh, there is as you like it there is merchant of venice there is uh, a midsummer night stream there is comedy of errors there is uh, twelfth night so none of the shakespearean comedies are named according to any hero or maybe a heroine but somehow these are pointing towards any particular crisis any particular problem because the names are indicating to them you see and also we have to concentrate on or consider the situations for what uh, that the plays are were written during this time for to example 12th night i'm coming to this later so what i'm trying to suggest here is the heroines in shakespearean romantic comedies are more important than the heroes okay uh, it is completely antithetical to uh, the shakespearean tragedies where you can find that the heroes are more important than the heroines the next important thing so far as shakespearean comedies are concerned i have to concentrate i have to discuss on uh, the the particular kind of you know uh, the, the the topical references you will find so for example let us let us consider shakespearean uh, comedy twelfth night you will find that twelfth night was written uh, for a, a a a festival and what is the festival you know the name it's it, it's signifying that it is twelfth night and it is considered as the the twelfth night after twenty fifth December you see okay it is probably it is referring to seventh of January. Hmm. This particular uh, this this festival this festival is named as uh, it is called the Epiphany Festival. You see, so Shakespeare when he wrote Twelfth Night, it had a particular purpose. You see, uh, he wrote Twelfth Night to be performed on the twelfth night after twenty fifth of December. Okay, and it was so, so. That is the reason fundamentally. You see that there was a kind of uh, epiphany festival that is going on, and Shakespeare wrote this particular play to be performed during the day or during this night. And somehow that is the fundamental reason why Shakespeare is deliberately taking some references from reality, and that is the fundamental reason why Shakespeare is implicating the huge, huge amount of or huge quantity of you know music and and the songs okay these were added in in 12th night to be specific and if you go through 12th night you will find fundamentally that, that the play actually begins with the reference to music you see if music be the food of love play on give me the excess of it that surfeiting the appetite may seek and so die so that is the fun that these are the words that are spoken by Duke Orsino at the very onset at the very beginning of this particular play uh, what I'm trying to suggest here that uh, the topical references or the topical associations that Shakespeare is deliberately taking here. Uh, for example, say it is 12th night, it is the Epiphanic Festival, it is the 7th January, okay, when this particular play was to be performed for the first time. And Shakespeare deliberately taking the, the fundamental political quest, the fundamental political problem that was going on in England during this time. You see that whenever you will think of the society where Shakespeare was in, there was a fundamental crisis. There was a fundamental tussle was between uh, the, the the people who are who are following the trains of festivity, and there were other characters who were to be considered as uh, against festivity, or against merriment, or against any kind of you see uh, the mirth and jollity. And these characters are called Puritan characters. You see the Puritanism. Okay, you will come to this later when, when I will discuss on Malvolio, obviously. These are the same Puritans whom uh, we will trace in the history of literature in the typical age of Milton, you see, when Oliver Cromwell will come to the forefront and Oliver Cromwell will lead the Puritans uh, or the Republicans to become uh, the, the rulers of England at the time, you see. Okay, when the Charles I was made beheaded okay and you know there was a particular time period from 1649 to 1660 this is called the puritan age but at the time of shakespeare you see you will find that the puritans were also present and in the play we will find the same characters being present like in the form of malvolio so somehow to criticize puritanism to show that uh, martin jollity is also needed it was another 
focus of Shakespeare, the Shakespeare dealt in, in Twelfth Night. It is, it is referring to a, a political, it is referring to a topical social and political association. And that's why in, in, in Twelfth Night you will find the character like Malvolio has to be girled, character like Malvolio has to be treated. Okay, the, critici the criticizing uh, perspectives are always being in work. So therefore, some topical references are altogether present, and these are all also present in, in considering the, the politics of the play. I will come to this later while discussing on, on Malvolio and the significations of the gulling of Malvolio scenes or so. As I've just discussed here, that it is a, a festival that is considered as the Epiphanic Festival. So Shakespeare deliberately chose the, the music and songs to be at that most, you see. Okay. Uh, say for example, if you think of Shakespearean uh, audience, then you will find the Shakespearean plays were generally performed on the theatres like Globe Theatre, there was a Swan Theatre, Cardin Theatre, Blackfriar Theatre, Rose Theatre, so they are the names of the theatres, you see. And somehow, if you if you go through the history of Shakespearean theatres, then ultimately we'll find that, uh, that the theatres were, uh, you know, who are the Shakespearean audiences? Mostly, you will find that the, the audience or the people who actually watched Shakespearean plays, these were groundlings. I am not completely excluding the upper, 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 the characters from the upper strata of society, the characters from the, the House of Lords or so. They came there, but they were engaged in their activities, you see. Okay, they were sitting in the upper stairs and they were just engaged in their activities. They are discussed on, on some politics. They were engaged in some lascivious activities altogether. So they didn't have such a mind to watch Shakespearean plays in detail. So fundamentally, you will find that the Shakespearean audience were mainly the groundlings. The groundlings were named as the one penny entrance, as you see. That they came to the theater by spending one penny, okay, and they stood just beside the, the front stage, okay. So Shakespeare always had to think about, uh, about these groundlings. So fundamentally, you will find that so far as Shakespearean comedies are concerned, you will find that there are characters like Feste and others, okay, and in their works, in their wordings, you see, the choosing of words, you will find they're very vulgar. Why I am stating this vulgarity is as a part of Shakespearean linguistics, so far as the comedies are concerned, because Shakespeare had to catch the attention of the groundlings, you see, that he had to create. It, it is not, we, we are reading, so for example, we are reading you know, in Shakespeare, it's an, in an academic discourse, you see. We are reading in undergraduate, we are reading in English honors, we are reading in, in Shakespearean uh, post-graduation, you see, that is PG courses or maybe in MPhil or PhD. But ultimately, don't think that when Shakespeare wrote these plays, he wrote these plays to be read at the PhDs or taking PhDs or MPhil classes or maybe the post-graduation. Ultimately, he had to sell his art, you see. Okay? Think about the commercial successes. So ultimately, Shakespeare wrote for his groundlings. And so that is why in Shakespearean comedies, we can find that the vulgarities have to be treated as uh, some of the most important ingredients to be present in the Shakespearean plays. And you will find that the vulgar implications, sexual implications, overt or maybe inert, the sexual implications are always present in Shakespearean plays. So far as the language is concerned, you will find the same thing is in organization here in, in Feste's works and in the words of Toby Belch. Uh, Toby, uh, yes. There is uh, Toby, there is... Uh, mm, uh, the, the, other characters like Fabian and Androck, Cheek, okay, and maybe Maria, the lower graded characters that have been included in this place. So, uh, apart from the language, you will find, as I've discussed just now, these are the musics and songs, and you will find there are ample references to the musics and songs. And Face Stay the Fool is very important concerning this because there are, say, three or four songs directly being performed on stage. Like, oh, mistress mind, where are you roaming? You know, it's a very important song. And ultimately, uh, there is come away, come away, death. There is another song. And the last song that is uh, with, with hey, ho, wind and the rain, that is the particular song. And there are ample references of music. If you if you see the performance of Shakespearean romantic comedies, uh, specifically Twelfth Night, you will find there are ample provisions where the, 
uh, the musicians are playing the music and the players are playing all together and there are ample references in the text so music and songs are very important in, in Shakespearean romantic comedies uh, that the fundamental uh, focus uh, concerning this particular play that is Twelfth Night you will find that the, it actually created a kind of enjoyment to the groundlings and at the same time these are some to some references to the musical perspectives and musical ambience that they are creating because it is made for the performance during Epiphanic Festival you see so that's why I will come to this later it's a it's a big topic that I have to discuss on there's a the role of the music and and uh, the importance of the songs so far as cons uh, considering the uh, 12th night there is the play so apart from that one another important thing that I have to discuss here the introduction to uh, 12th night that is uh, or maybe the features of Shakespearean comedies in general uh, there is the characters you see in most cases we find that in Shakespearean tragedies the characters are coming from the upper strata of society mostly mostly you will find that Macbeth Hamlet Othello King Lear these are all characters who are coming from the upper strata okay say Macbeth is a general who is becoming the king later uh, Hamlet is the prince prince of Denmark you see and somehow you, you know it's uh, he's coming from the upper strata of society Othello is obviously a general you know and there is King Lear King Lear was a king so fundamentally you will find the most of the plays and so is Antonio Cleopatra and others you know Julius Caesar and Coriolanus and others other characters but somehow whenever we are discussing on uh, Shakespearean comedies you will find that yes there are some characters who are coming from the upper strata of society who are belonging to the house of lords or maybe the the you know the superior classes but at the same time you will find that in Shakespearean comedies there are ample provisions of the characters who are coming from the lower section of the society that is fundamental very important you see why I'm stating that lower strata is important because you will find somehow that in Shakespearean plays, uh, uh, you know, that Shakespeare actually came from the lowest state of society. Shakespeare was not an, uh, a person who is belonging or who was belonging to the upper section of society. Okay. So somehow uh, the basic form of intellect that Shakespeare is proposing to be present within the, within the characters like Feste, he must represent a particular culture. He must represent a particular social strata he must represent a particular intellect that is being associated with the, the fundamental knowledge of the life itself you see it's a kind of a philosophy that is being grown within these persons so think about the persons who didn't face poverty think about the persons who didn't face any kind of obligations or maybe the problems or any kind of say tussles and conflicts you know the, the political stripes and at the same time their economic problems are so the fundamental you know the existential crisis is being faced by these persons so fundamentally the characters from the upper strata of society they did not face them and Shakespeare is deliberately choosing characters from the lower strata of society like Pester the Fool just because he is treating them with utmost importance say for example Feste you will find that somehow Feste is the most intelligent character in this play and the second second one is obviously Maria and then there is Viola obviously but somehow in Feste's words, you will find some philosophical discourses have been taken into consideration. Feste speaks. It is not for the, the, the wording's sake, you know. The songs of Feste that Feste sings at this moment, the words that Feste speaks, okay, uh, and the, the basic philosophy that he's expressing, somehow these are very important and Shakespeare is deliberately choosing them. So the lower character or lower strata characters are very important, you see, somehow. And Shakespeare is treated them, or Shakespeare is treating them uh, carefully, very carefully. So the lower characters are lower. Uh, the characters from the lower strata are very important in Shakespearean plays altogether. Here you will find Peste, and obviously the references to the other characters who are belonging to the lower strata. Another important uh, thing that I have to discuss here, you see, uh, uh, you know, Shakespearean plays, or, or say for example in Shakespearean time you will find that somehow um, the female characters were not permitted to perform on stage okay so Shakespeare not only Shakespeare but also other directors or other uh, say persons who are engaged with the theaters and performances public performances 
they had to choose the boy actors to perform or for the performance of the female characters on stage. Who are the boy actors? The characters whose voices have not been changed. The characters whose birds and mustaches have not come yet. Okay. And they actually played the role of the female characters somehow. So you will find that in Shakespearean plays, uh, there are ample references of cross-dressing. You know what is cross-dressing? That is a male character is playing the role of a female on stage. And in most of the time, uh, she has been treated as a male character within the text. Say for example, think of Twelfth Night. You will find that uh, Viola is playing uh, or disguising as Caesario throughout the play. Throughout the play. That is the most section of the play. So where is the, the facility or where is the uh, advantage for using such kind of disguise? you will find that that actually signifies a male character like the, the boy actor you see he is playing the role of a male character on stage so it will be beneficial to him okay uh, somehow uh, that is the fundamental reason i will come to this later when i will deal with disguise and obviously the other sections cross dressing is very important so far as the theatrical perspectives are concerned in in shakespearean plays especially in in twelfth night and also in other plays like you see uh, uh, portia had to play the role of ganymede and uh, there is uh, rosaline who had to again uh, use the disguise somehow why the disguises have been incorporated in shakespearean plays that is a fundamental question here you will find that uh, so far as the play is concerned, you will find mistaken identity, deception, self-deception, disguise. These are the words which are very important. Say, for example, in Twelfth Night, you know, there's a subtitle of Twelfth Night or alternative title that is called, uh, or what you will. That means you can do what you will. So fundamentally, uh, disguise has to be treated with much more importance here in Twelfth Night because uh, somehow you will find that uh, Caesario, the role of Caesario is very significant. And Shakespeare is creating a twin, you know, there is Sebastian, okay, who is the twin to Caesario, that is Viola, and somehow at the very onset of the play you will find that when viola is using an attar a male attar and becoming caesario and sebastian they are to some extent becoming similar so the mistaken identity plays a big role in shakespearean comedies okay as we find the most important one is you know it's comedy of errors okay is the best example the similar kind of trait has to be treated here also and you will find that disguise plays a big role in Twelfth Night also. Okay, so it will be, it will make some some tussles. You know, it's a kind kind of a comedy of intrigue, as I've already suggested, because the plot construction is creating a kind of a note. You know, the intrigue is being built, and somehow this particular knot will not be uh, untied by the characters. Rather, it will be made by time. There is a particular speech by Viola in Twelfth Night where Viola speaks, uh, Viola utters, O time, thou must untangle this knot. Not I. It is too hard a knot for me to untie. So somehow uh, it is the time that actually creates the, the untangling of the knot. And fundamentally, so far as the plot construction of this particular play is concerned, you will find a particular kind of an intrigue is being incorporated. The intrigue will be, uh, will be made to be at the highest position and somehow gradually as the play progresses, the knot is becoming untangled. Okay, so for that particular reason, to create the intrigue maximum, you see, disguise is obviously uh, needed why because the mistaken identity can create multiple kinds of problems that means it can create 
multiple kinds of intrigues for example there is a a, a word that is spoken by the, the speech is by viola she says uh, disguise i see thou art wickedness wherein the pregnant enemy does much that means disguise itself is wicked as if like a pregnant enemy that gives birth to multiple enemies you see why because the problem is when viola is using the attire of cesario he is presenting himself herself as an eunuch you see okay so what happens you know she identifies that olivia falls in love with cesario but we the spectators know and viola knows that she is not a male figure so it is not possible for olivia to love any male rather she is expressing her love in the form of the of the ring you see to a female so what happens to be true so far as the plot is concerned you will find that duke orsino is in love with olivia olivia is in love with cesario that is viola actually and viola is in love with duke orsino so a perfect kind of a triangle is being created and what is the fundamental reason behind this creation disguise mistaken identity that creates a kind of deception to others and by extension that is creating a kind of self deception to this woman that is viola so that is the knot that is that cannot be untangled by by viola herself she says therefore o time thou must untangle this knot that is that it is time the time with resolute all these things is so so fundamentally that is the fundamental reason you say that uh, why disguise and uh, relating uh, you know mistaken identity deception self deception the intrigue that have been created to be uh, at the core of these plays why these are very much important concerning that uh, 12th night and concerning the other plays altogether another thing that is important as i have suggested here uh, that is uh, you know somehow uh, in 12th night you will find uh, that romance and realism these are playing big roles here romance and realism you see why i am stating romance and realism because these are being considered as something antithetical as you know that romance is related to love and romance is related to imagination altogether as i when i was uh, discussing on the on the structure of the romantic comedy at the very beginning of this lecture you have traced that i have indicated towards the concept of romance that is being related to something imaginary and that is why the shakespeare is deliberately choosing some imaginary landscapes he is deliberately choosing some imaginary characters and also the imaginary setting for his place fundamentally you will find that in shakespearean play like 12th night we will find that romance is playing a big role it is not only considering the the structure of the play not only considering the the situation of the play or maybe the setting of the play but at the same time you will find that romance plays a big role in the conception of creating characters in the conception of creating the uh, the play in general you see that's the structure of the plot in general okay but at the same time you will find that whether in the construction of the love affair whether in the construction of the setting whether in the construction of the characters whether in the construction of the plot in general there are some ample provisions of romance there are some ample provisions of imagination but at the same time that is fundamentally very important concerning shakespearean romantic comedies and uh, to be specific concerning 12th night you will find that realistic perspectives or the using of realism is not to be completely negated in shakespearean plays and obviously in 12th night there are ample provisions of realism you see you will find there are characters who are realistic 
you will find there are situations that may be considered to be realistic. Say for example, face day, face is philosophy, face is life, the problems, you know, he's ever, you know, hankering after money because money is needed, you see, in a society who are typical, uh, you know, different kinds of obligations, different kinds of dominations is in war, class differentiation is in war. There are altogether characters like Viola who is also suffering from the realistic crisis, different kinds of crisis she is facing. Why she has to use the attire of a, female, of a male? Just because she says at the very beginning to the sea captain that I, what will I do in a society which is completely male dominated? So there is obviously I am without any male relative. So actually Viola's wordings these are indicating towards the basic problem that a female actually faces. It is a typical patriarchal society, you see. Okay. And ultimately, you will find that a female member, a female, okay, without any male relative, it is very hard for her to live alone. That is the fundamental thing. That's why, that's why, so, say, think socially. Think about the societal problems. Think about some realistic problems. You will find that Viola using the attire of a male, or maybe here it is Una. So ultimately, you will find that somehow these are indicating towards different kinds of problems. Think about the characters like Toby Belch. Think about the characters like Andrew Ochik. Think about the characters like Maria. Each and everywhere you will find that the money plays a big role. Okay? I will come to this later while discussing about the, the minor characters of this play. Discussing about the, the altogether other section. The, the vengeance that they are taking against Malvolio. So, somehow considering the topical references, considering the politics they are working behind, considering the, the character of Feste and his words, considering the problems that money will make, considering the, the fundamental problem that Viola is facing, and that's why he's, she's using the male attire, considering the problem that is faced by Antonio, the character like Antonio, yes. So everywhere you will find some realistic implications are always in work. So don't consider Shakespearean romantic comedies as simply romantic. Simply they are dealing with romances. Consider Shakespearean romantic comedies as uh, plays that are making a kind of a blend between romance and realism altogether. So that is why these plays are very important. So these are the basic you know, features. Apart from them, there are there are multiple others, obviously. But I have identified these are the salient features that can be traced in Shakespearean romantic comedies. And obviously, these have to be considered as most important topics regarding the, the structuration and regarding the reading of Twelfth Night altogether. Okay. And in our next discussion, I will go through some sections of the text. And I will discuss on the, the basic topics, you see, okay, that are very important uh, regarding the reading of, of Twelfth Night. Okay, so today up to this, thank you.